I could convince 10 people who read the book to think about the fact that businesses are huge levers for social change. And that's true whether you want them to be or not. And so if they approach that reality, they can't be avoided with a sense of intentionality and thoughtfulness and planfulness, uh, then my book has succeeded. I also think it's pretty entertaining. And so I was hoping to make a few people laugh as well. The thing that drove the success was understanding first what success meant. And so I talk about this in the book quite a bit about the idea of a person needs a personal definition of success. You know, who, who is it that's creating that definition for you? And the answer, unless you're being intentional about it, is almost always somebody else, society, government, church, friends, family, who knows? There's a lot of different entities that will spoon feed you a, a definition of success. And so success starts from understanding what success is. Like you, you can't achieve it unless you know it. And so, um, you know, I think Grow Hub was a success because um, I grew a lot while I was in it. I had a lot of coworkers who got somewhere, you know, who, who grew in their talents and, and also made some money. It was a success because it helped a lot of independent restaurants. And those are all things that are different from it went through an IPO, which is what everybody I think assumes the success is. But um, for me, it was the fact that it was a constant learning process. I was constantly trying to iterate on how to make a great customer product, how to deliver that to customers, how to do it in a profitable way, how to make a great working environment, all of those things, that sort of constant iteration and testing and, and reinventing ourselves you know, four or five times throughout the course of the business. Those were all successes along the way. reality of, of trying to achieve a, a big goal and to really put yourself out there and put the effort in over time, it, it is hard and hard things have consequences um, to relationships, to other elements of our lives, to ourselves, to our ability to keep going. The one piece of advice I have about hard things, and this was true, this was true at Grubhub, but I didn't know it was true until I was on the bike trip, which was um, don't quit at night, like don't quit at 10 p.m. because or, or even 5 p.m. because you're tired and you're exhausted and it's hard to keep going. You don't have a lot of energy. And the idea of like coming back and doing it again tomorrow is really tough. That same, like by 9 a.m. the next morning after a good night's sleep, that same challenge doesn't seem as bad. And so I always say quit things in the morning as opposed to at the end of a long day. And after you're rested, if you still don't think your activity is lined up with your goals, that's a good time to like walk away and try something else. And I, and I think quitting in the morning is, is ends up being this idea of a goal oriented quitting versus giving up uh, the previous evening when you're just too tired to keep going. We do our work activity. We start, whether that's starting businesses or whatever, um, we don't do it in a vacuum. We're within, within the relationships we live in, the support groups that we live in, that we're part of either supporting or being supported. And, and I say in the book, you know, if you have an idea, go for it, just start, don't overthink it. But that's a, that's a position coming from a place of privilege that I recognize that um, I, at the time I started my company, I didn't have uh, any kids that were depending on me. I had, I had, I was in good health. Um, I'm fortunately still in good health. I had a lot of people supporting me and I didn't have a lot of energy that I had to put towards supporting other people, which is a, which is just not always the case for everyone. And so um, it is absolutely critical to have that support network and have people support you, especially when there are times during the journey when you just simply don't have enough hours in the day to invest as much time in relationships as they need to thrive. And so I had a very patient understanding wife who was in relation with me while I went through this whole process was understanding of, of, of that. And, um, and the second time around as I've started this new business fixer, um, it's just all that much more important that like, I, I, I live in an environment where I'm not like, I'm not in a vacuum. I still have to support the relationships that I'm in and people still support me and thinking of things more holistically this time around, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to do it in a way that doesn't require sacrifice from the other people that are around me in the way that the first time around it did. The second rule of mergers is make the other team 
think that your stuff is more valuable than their stuff, which is like where I messed up with this in our initial conversations with Campus Food is I was just kind of a jerk in those conversations uh, because I got I, I fell into this trap of the dueling blowfish where each of us was trying to make ourselves look bigger than the other the other person. But I did it in a way that was really socially pretty unacceptable. And and I learned from that. And and I've come to realize if you start a company or if you're in a company that's competing with another one, which is every company, by the way, the people who are you're competing with are as close to you as anyone else that you know. They are solving the same problems for the same types of customers. And so you have an awful lot in common with them. And when we went through the merger, I came to find that some of my favorite coworkers over the course of the entire time at Grubhub were the people that were at Seamless. And I really, really enjoyed working with them. And uh, I had spent far too much time worried and angry and frustrated and all of those things about competition in the marketplace instead of appreciating that other people are also trying to make the world better in their way. On the bike journey, I had a couple goals. One was just physically to get across the country, get from Virginia to Oregon. But there was something much deeper going on, which was I wanted to decompress and find some through through an amount of solitude and being present in, in nature as I rode across the country, like really reflect on what had happened and what I wanted to do next. And something happened. By the time I was halfway across the country, I was like, well, that was enough of that. Now I'm actually more interested in the relationships that I developed uh, with other cyclists as I've gone. And that was like, not even, that was the furthest thing from my mind when I started. It was like, I was on Survivor and I was like, I'm not here to make friends. Like, like it just wasn't in my goal uh, when I started the started the ride. And then that became the goal. And so there's this thing that happened at, at Grubhub and it also happened on the bike trip, which is, it's the, it's the nature of the human journey that as we approach our goals and we change, we change. And as we change, our goals change. And it's okay. It's okay to abandon old goals that previous versions of ourselves set and try new things. And in fact, um, the, the giving yourself the grace to do that allows you to take bigger risks, right? Like I wasn't, I didn't start, I didn't start with, I need to be able to cycle over a mountain. I started with, I need to get 40 miles up the coast. And I got to tell you that first mountain range just about did me in. Uh, but then by the time I got through it, I was strong enough to make it through across the rest of the country easily. And so I, I learned a lot. I adapted. I got better at what I was doing as I went. Start, do the thing, make the product, sell it, start the thing. And we spend so much time you know, stuck in the inertia of our day-to-day -day jobs and our, and our obligations, and our commitments. It's very hard to take that step and, and to actually put yourself out there and, and sell a product. And in fact, it's so hard that I think it's a predictor of success, that everything that you do from the moment that you start until you sell a business or retire, that's 49% of running a business. 51% is just the first moment when you actually sell an actual product to an actual customer. And you just start the thing. And so I'm a strong believer in that. I think, you know, we, we all are in different places from an opportunity perspective, from a privilege perspective. Not everyone can just quit their job and go full time at doing a thing. But regardless of your situation, uh, it is always a risky moment to put yourself out there and take take a risk to start something, whether it's full time or in a more limited way or whatever that means. Uh, and so I just encourage people to do it. Um, I, I, I think that most people, if you define success and you just go for it without spending too much time worried about, is this going to work? Um, I think most people are, are successful within their own definition of success. If I could go back 20 years in time and hand myself the book I just wrote, I'd say, think bigger. Think like, make your goals harder to hit. Like, I understand you, the 26 year old version of me, want to pay off your school debt, but you're gonna create a business that's so big that 70,000 restaurants depend on you for your, li their, your livelihood. So make sure the DN in the DNA of the company that you create, being of service to restaurants and independent restaurants and leveling the playing field relative to chains is in the DNA of the company and can't be changed. You know, I, I would talk to myself about being more intentional from the very start. I learned that lesson as I went. And my hope is with the book, 
someone else can read it and say, you know, I'm going to be more intentional about this business I start and the impact I create in the communities that I serve from the very first moment. After my time at Grubhub, uh, I had this moment of what now? And I had, I had a lot of resources. I had the cash from the IPO. I had coworkers who had done really great, great work with me. I had investors who believed in me. I had all the skill that I had developed. And I spent a lot of time thinking about like, what business can I create where the social impact and the financial return can't be divorced? And so I ended up creating Fixer, which is an on-demand handy person service. And the whole idea behind the business is that the supply of skilled fixers is just not sufficient relative to the demand from homeowners for those people's skills. And so we created a W-2 workforce with, with benefits, full-time with benefits that we train from scratch. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to increase the skill and diversity of tradespeople in the communities we serve. And by creating this supply that didn't exist previously, by training people from scratch, we're making it much more accessible for homeowners to be able to, to get people into their homes who can do the work. But I went a step further. We didn't just create the business. We, we actually created it as a public benefit corporation where all the way down at the corporate charter, the value to the stakeholders, to the fixers themselves and the communities we serve is of equal importance to the return to shareholders 